Well, the message tonight is parallel to the message last week, not planned. Freddie was talking about plateauing. Well, the message tonight is about excuses and mediocrity. And the title is, Quit Making Excuses <coughs> to Not Be Awesome. Amen? See, every time you try to do something extraordinary, you will bump into someone who will be resistant of that, like a gatekeeper of, of objection and, and justifications of why it can't be done, why it will never work. And do you know the reason? It's because it never worked for them. So they're assuming that it's not going to work for you. A clear sign of leadership maturity is the willingness to take responsibility. And I know that's like a big adult word, but how many adults are still squirming away from taking responsibility for their actions, making excuses as to why they act the way they do, how they treat people the way that they do, why they behave the way they do, and why they justify for their personal failures. A true leader will not accept that. They will take responsibility for their actions, but they will not make excuses for the people in their team. And this is a team, right? A church is an organization, it's a body. So it is a group of people that can offer different gifts, talents, and it's not by chance that we're all knitted together in this place. You know, it's a divine appointment that we really need to consider and evaluate. You know, what excuses are the people who are church hopping? You know, what, what are their excuses? Or what, what were they thinking about? Do they think that they can just go to church and hear the word and not get affected and thinking that they've done their, their duty, right? And not be accountable for what they've heard. See, the Bible says to study, right, to show ourselves approved unto God, a workman needing not be ashamed, rightfully dividing the word of truth. I am really, you know, evaluating my message myself because I don't want to give in to lame brain excuses because I think it's pretty shallow. You know, when you are not making any type of plan, then really you are planning to fail. Okay, so why would we be a failure when, one, the Holy Spirit is living inside of us, leading, guiding, and directing us, right? And number two, we live in one of the most prosperous, if not the prosperous countries in the world, where everyone wants to migrate here. So why should we be a failure? I believe that excellence and mediocrity is a choice. And the question is, where do you spend most of your time? People who rationalize failure are practically uncoachable, untrainable, and unchangeable. Do you know people like that? Where you tell them something and they say, I know, I know, I know, I know. I had someone like that training her many years ago. 
in medical assisting, and every time I came near her, because I was watching her, she knew. I know, I know. And I said, okay, well, she was about ready to um, do a venipuncture, which is drawing blood. And I, you know, I said, okay, I didn't try to make her nervous because there was another person there. So I said, just make sure you don't recap, okay, so that you don't stick yourself. I know, I know, I know. So then she tries to put the, the syringe, the vacutainer, and the needle together, and she couldn't because she was so nervous, and they were backwards, right? And I'm like, oh, my gosh. Well, this was many years ago. This was before I knew I was saved. I mean, I didn't say anything right there and then, but I called a school and I said, no, she can't really stay here anymore because I can't even show her or teach her how to do something because she knows. I don't know if that was just a nervous response, but I know, I know, I know, okay? Well, no, you can't possibly know everything. So if someone is imparting something to you, I think it would behoove you <laughs> like that. I was looking for an opportunity to use that to just be silent and listen. You know the letters in silent and listen are all the same? If you just switch them around, silent, listen. You cannot listen if you're constantly running your mouth. Excuses are the DNA of underachievers. Love it. Someone had asked me the other day, stupidity must be one of your pet peeves. LOL. And I thought, yes, it is. Because I feel that there's a lot of common, not enough sense going around. And it's like people... Some people, I mean, it's okay to make stupid mistakes or a stupid mistake in an area, right? But if you keep repeating the same stupid mistakes, then there is something wrong with you. Do not abuse the privileges of being or acting stupid because by then you're just labeled as a fool, okay? And does a fool delight in God? No. Or does God delight in a fool? No. So, making excuses, to me, I believe, is a sin because you are in denial. And when you're in denial, your mind is stuck on old belief system that you are refusing to change flat out. Okay, when you're living in denial, you're saying nothing will ever work because I'm stuck in this rut and I am living in misery because so-and-so made me feel this way or something happened to me in the past, therefore I cannot move on and this is why I am the way that I am today. I will give you a list of you know, famous excuses that we probably all have heard ourselves say but don't fret because you know we can change like after hearing the message tonight I pray that you will be more cognizant of what you say when you don't want to do anything don't make excuses I can't or I won't right someone invites you over for dinner well you had no plans then so you said yes and then somebody else invited you to go do something funner. Okay? That's shameful if you cancel that dinner to go to something funner. Especially in this place. Okay? Be good to all, especially in the household of faith. You know, we all have made excuses, and my excuses hurt me the most because though I feel that sense of 
self-preservation, self-preservation or self-protection, I still end up the biggest loser because I am not doing my best. I am not cultivating what is inside me. I'm not realizing my, my purpose or my, my, um, my full potential. It's like, you know, I, I'm, why? What is my excuse? Is it because I'm scared? Is it because... I'm really lazy, but I don't want to admit to anybody that I'm lazy. I don't want to work hard. Okay? I am not lazy or I'm not afraid to work hard, okay? But I am sure that those are traits that I have battled. But because I have been, like, in a home where both parents were working, both parents were very... Um, how do you say it, encouraging and loving and put values in working hard and working smart. That's what I grew up in. So that may not be my excuse, but I'm sure I've come up with some other excuses in other areas that I didn't realize, okay? But thankfully, thankfully, God is merciful, amen? So I want to read to you the definition of mediocre or mediocrity. And, you know, this is like really short. It says, moderate to inferior in quality. Ordinary. And this definition reflects an accurate picture of what happens when one engages in the blame game. Right? You made me do that. You made me say that. Really? I almost found myself saying that to my son. You know, they get you so riled up. Because you... I realized, no, he didn't make me do anything. I had a choice. I had a choice to say it or not say it. Sure, my emotions were fired up. I was upset and I was feeling intensified in the moment that he was lucky he was not near me. <laughs> okay? So you, it's like I wanted to say, you made me so angry. Yes, his behavior was getting me angry, but he was not about to make me do anything, right? I had a choice. Mediocrity, this just has dawned on me. Mediocrity starts with me. And the beginning of mediocrity, right? It's M-E. It starts with me. It's not something or someone does to you. It is a result of choices that you have made in the past, in the present, and the choices that you will make in the future. It is a personal concession to less than your best. You are choosing to either achieve something or not. Right? I mean, you know that scripture, that verse, you know, many are called, but a few are chosen. You know, think about that. You know what the Holy Spirit showed me what that meant because I asked? is like, it's like, you know, people go to school, right? Let's just say college, you know, in a university setting. There's a lot of people going to that school, that college, that university. Many are there, but only a few make it to the dean's list. Why? Right? Because they're overachievers. They work hard, right? And, you know, they... They just want to go for the gusto. And I'm not saying that if you didn't make it to the dean's list that you're no good because, you know, you got your reward when you got your diploma, okay? It's just the system, the reward system was they got more because they put forth more. So it's really up to us if we want to be excellent or 
Mediocre. Who wants to be called mediocre? I mean, that's good enough. That's just good enough. Really? You know, do we say that to our kids? Oh, that's good enough. That's good enough. Yeah, you don't need to study anymore for that test. Tomorrow you got to see. Come on. Right? Don't we push them and encourage them and say, you can do better. You can do better because I know that you can. We want to encourage them so that they can strive harder, not to be competitive, but to understand the value of working for something that you like. It doesn't come easy, and it's not given or handed to you, right? The only thing that you do not work for is salvation. That is free, and it's a gift from God. But have you heard of a free lunch? You know, the world system today, it says there ain't no free lunch. Because even when you are invited to something like those, um, what do you call them? Those timeshare invites. You know, it's, yeah, you, they give you incentive to eat and, you know. But you've got to listen to them for like, two, three hours, so that wasn't free. You gave up your time, okay? So there ain't no free lunch. They invited you there for a reason. They have a motive. So if you break free from mediocrity by making better decisions, then your conditions will also be favorable. They will change. Once your thinking pattern changes, so a man thinks, right? So is he. What do you think about? What do you want to do? Are you the kind who just makes up his or her mind and say, that's it. I'm just going to remain a loser. Or I'm not going to strive because after all, I'm okay. I'm okay. I can take care of myself and who cares about tomorrow? I mean, I know that we are not to worry about tomorrow, but the Bible is also talking about leaving a heritage to your children. What kind of heritage are you leaving behind? You know, your exampleship. What is it? Let's go ahead and turn to Luke 14, verses 15 to 24. Okay, this is the parable that Jesus illustrated about the great feast, okay? This is really something else. So he um, was talking about, about um, having a big banquet, and it says, When one of those at the table with him heard this, he said to Jesus, Blessed is the man who will eat at the feast in the kingdom of God. And then Jesus replied, A certain man was preparing a great banquet and invited many guests. At the time of the banquet, he sent his servant to tell those who had been invited, Come, for everything is now ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said, I have just bought a field and I must go and see it. Please excuse me. Another one said, I have just bought five yoke of oxen, and I'm on my way to try them out. Who tries an oxen out, right? Please excuse me. Still another said, I just got married. Whew. So I can't come. The servant came back and reported this to his master. Then the owner of the house became angry and ordered his servant, go out quickly into the streets and alleys of the town and bring in the poor the crippled, the blind, and the lame. Sir, the servant said, what you ordered has been done, but there is still room. Then the master told his servant, go out to the roads and country lanes and make them come in so that my house will be full. I tell you, not one of those men who were invited will get a taste of my banquet. That's a parable that Jesus used. What were their excuses? Possession, right? Relationship. 
What else? And livelihood. Come on. After we get blessed with all of that, we can't even come to the invite. So basically that's what he's talking about, like, you know, the church. Or in before it's like for the Israelites, right? It's like come, but all of them, none of them wanted to follow None of them wanted to come. They all had excuses. So extend the invitation to all. So basically, it's saying those who didn't come lost out on a good thing. They've missed out. How many opportunities are we missing out on? Because we make excuses. Or when we are partial or biased. You know, when someone who's not of a very high reputable status is talking to you, how do you treat them? Do you spend, do you take the time to talk to them? Or do you show them that it's, oh, you know, they're nobody. You know, so you just walk away and just kind of like, oh, yeah, hi, hi, how are you? And then you just walk away again, that how are you without waiting for a response, right? How are you? And then you didn't wait for the response, but... It's so superficial, and we ought not treat anyone like that, especially if you've been, you know, saved in a period of time. Living in denial prolongs your marriage with mediocrity. If you don't face it, you cannot fix it. The box that you've put yourself in will one day become a casket. How many broken and dashed and unfulfilled dreams are you bringing into the casket because of excuses? How many opportunities that have knocked? You know, I've seen a quote. If if an opportunity or if opportunity doesn't knock, build a door. I like that. Okay, you know, for those positive thinkers and speakers out there, I thought that was pretty cool. You know, you you make a way because you have that God kind of faith in you. Or I believe I do. I believe I do. That victorious faith because he says I do. And you know how I know that I'm possessing it is because I believe the word of God is true, so I act on it. That's faith right? It doesn't become faith until you put it into action because faith is taking risks. So if you're full of excuses, that means you have never taken any risk. You're afraid to fail. You know, we would not be in the, the uh, what, like smartphones and all these wonderful technologies and <clears throat> inventions if people were scared to fail, We wouldn't be because nobody would have taken any chance, any chances. Like, they they don't want to be broke. They don't want to be bankrupt. But if you believe in something, you are also ready to believe to die for it. First to live for it and also to die for it. You know, and making excuses mean you don't really stand for anything. You don't believe in anything. That's why you're a mediocre. You're an average Joe. Okay, again, I am not knocking anything that, you know, please don't mistake it for like, okay, I'm working as a whatever, a custodian, a mechanic, a bus driver. It doesn't matter what you do. It's how you think and how you perceive yourself and how you carry yourself. Okay, it's how you carry yourself. You are not, Eleanor Roosevelt, that's one of my favorite quotes. No one can make me feel inferior without my consent. Okay, because I will have to give you permission to to talk down to me, to, right? I will have to give you permission because I have a choice to say, Hold up and walk away. Excuse you and excuse me. 
this conversation is now over. Or you can choose to go crazy and ballistic and then start fighting and then pray later. I don't know. You have a choice. You can choose to walk out victoriously or you can choose to lose your testimony. Which is it? Right? So decide to break up with mediocrity and cancel your subscription to excuses. Amen? Put away your belt in shame and accept responsibility for your results. Grow up and man up. The thing with um, people who don't want to take responsibility is because they don't want to grow up. You know, I don't want to grow up because then I'll have to be responsible, right? Like Peter Pan in Never Never Land. He didn't want to grow up. But it says change is inevitable, but growth is optional. I, I think that we do have the propensity to not want to grow up because, after all, you know, you kind of see what's happening and then it doesn't, you don't like it, so you kind of just get comfortable right where you're at. So, you know, then we become complacent, but that's a very dangerous thing. When you become complacent, it's like you don't even know that you're drifting. You don't even know that you're far from God. You don't even know that you're not even spiritual anymore. Okay? Because you become so complacent. You are so blessed that you forgot to be responsible. That you want to be blessed, but you don't want, you only want the benefits, but you don't want the responsibility. Well, you know what? Sooner or later, you're going to have to decide better than that. Because you know what? One day, it'll come, you know, very, very close to you, in front of you, and you will have to make a choice. Stop defending. This is for everyone, especially when you work, when you're working, and you work with people, or you manage people, or lead people. You know, so it's in every walk of life. Stop defending mediocrity in others on your team, okay? Face reality about their skills, talent, discipline, attitude, character, or gifts. Their calling. Do not allow them to make excuses for not performing the way that they are expected to perform, right? Because... You know, if you are a true leader, you should be able to inspire and motivate them. Okay? It's, it's like working together to achieve a common goal. And teamwork, isn't that what it stands for? Together, everyone achieves more. It, this is not a one-man, you know, uh, show. It's when you are securing yourself, when you know who you are, you know when someone is making excuses. But then, you know, when, when someone is talking to you or you're talking to them and all you hear is, but, but, okay, but, or justification and, oh, I know, I know, but, what does that tell you? You know, would you still continue to talk to them? You know, they, they're rejecting counsel. And, and we were talking about, what kind of friend are you? You know, if you're a well-rounded friend, you know, I can be a straight-talking friend. Maybe I might not tell you right away that your zipper is open, <laughs> okay, especially if it's the opposite sex. But I had. Not here. Okay? I couldn't stand it anymore. It's like, zip it up. <laughs> I didn't know how else to say it. <laughs> Sorry. While walking away, zip it up. And, of course, he didn't get it right away. Oh, my gosh. Anyway, you know, that was uncomfortable, but, you know, I had to do it, right? Um, somebody had to do it. But straight-talking friends, sometimes, you know, it's, it's because you don't want them to continue going that path. I think you're talking to them because you care about them. You don't want to hear their excuses. 
Because would you like your kids to make excuses to you and you know they're lying? <laughs> you know they're making excuses. Are you going to let them get away? You might let them get away, but you are planning something good for like a form of punishment. Okay? Hey, I'm a parent, so I know. And I've tried many. You know, some didn't work and some did. So our father knows what's best for us. Let's talk about Moses. Moses is one one guy that had a lot of excuses that almost exasperated God. Okay. Let's go to Exodus 4, verses 10 through 12. Let's take a look at that. <clears throat> you know, he lived in the desert for 40 years, right? <clears throat> God didn't want his excuses. He wanted his cooperation. Okay. But Moses was just flying off with all kinds of excuses until he couldn't anymore. So 4.10. You know, sometimes you get excitable up here that you kind of lose your train of thoughts and then God takes you somewhere that you didn't plan. Okay. Moses said to the Lord, O oh Lord, I have never been eloquent, neither in the past nor since you have spoken to your servant. I am slow of speech and tongue. But, 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 but Lord, I, I can't go. I stutter. Okay. He says, well, who made your tongue? What did, uh, look. Uh, but Moses, O oh Lord, please send someone else to do it. What about your brother Aaron the Levite? Let me read the list that I have written. He says, one, I have no experience. That's in Exodus 3, 11 through 12. I have no experience, Lord. I don't know what to do, okay? And, you know, please send someone else. He keeps saying that, please send someone else. When God calls you to do something, he will win. But you do have a choice. But you know what? Just understand that your choice of disobeying or not going or not doing will have some consequences. Okay? Because he's God after all. He created you. Exodus 3.13. Who shall I say sent me? It's like, where does he come up with these <laughs> questions, right? I'm like reading this. Wow, who shall I say sent me? What did he say? What did God say? I am. I am sent you. I think that should, I should have probably stopped. I, if I was Moses, I would have stopped there, okay? And then Exodus 4, 2, 9, through 9. Um, what if they don't believe me? Okay. See, he wants God to show signs to them, okay, because I'm sure he's afraid, okay? And then the other one was, because he made five excuses. I already said that my tongue is not eloquent. Exodus 4.13. I hate to bring this up, Lord, but I killed a man. And I've been eating dust for 40 years. Can you please find someone else? By that time, God was, you know, pretty upset. I'm sending you your, with you your brother. Now go. Okay. You tell Pharaoh to let my people go. Well, eventually, he did. He had so many excuses that it was like a battle, delaying, right? Delaying the plan of that great exodus, that great exit out of Egypt because he was negotiating. You know, it's like, just do it. Just do it. So... I'm thinking that one of the saddest epitaphs that we will ever see for medio mediocrity, mediocre lives, will be that when we die, we are still so full of potential, right? And we will be haunted by the classic lament. Do you know what they would be? 
if I could have, would have, should have. You know, I wouldn't want to die hoping that I've done this, said that, been there. Why not do it while you're alive? And I'm not talking about just traveling. I'm not talking about worldly desires. I'm not talking about, you know, vacationing and shopping spree that you can't afford. I'm talking about doing something wholesome and worthwhile and, you know, something that is kingdom building, something that is winning souls. What are your excuses for not witnessing, for not testifying of the love of God, for not being committed to coming to church, for not giving, not tithing? What are your excuses? What's your excuse for not completing something you start all the time? What? You see, when we do a deep self evaluation, we will find the answers, okay? And I will give you these lists, okay? Actually, it's a list, but there are 12 of them. Most annoying excuses for your mediocrity. You know that mediocrity is crowded, but excellence is full of room. It's, it is wide open. Why? Because not too many people reside there. Number one, I'm not smart enough. Well, we're not all meant to be Einstein, but God gave us a brain, and he gave us creativity. Find something that you're good at. Okay, that's not an excuse, but it is here. I don't have the right degree. You know, I don't have the right degree, but God gave me the right job. And, well, that's all I'm going to say to that because he, I can boast on my God. He gave me a job that pays people with a double degree. Okay, so what's my excuse for not excelling? I'm broke, got no money, so I can't do anything. Well, it's true that money can make things easier, right? But have you ever seen that movie, From Homeless to Harvard? That really stuck to me because, man, that poor girl, it's like she almost had no chance. But my God, she was homeless. Her parents were totally dysfunctional and unfit. Unloved, running the street, and went on to be a Harvard graduate. And now she's a, a speaker, a, a motivator, um, well sought after, you know, like worldwide, globally. I'm too old. Okay, Joshua and Caleb, right? What, they were in their 80s when they said, give me my mountain. You know, I've always wondered why they say you cannot teach old dogs or an old dog new tricks. Correction. You cannot teach an uninterested, dry, lazy, complacent new tricks. But you can teach an old dog a new trick or new tricks. Number five, I don't have any connections. Really? Tweet that. Okay. Number six, no one will help me. Really? People who don't get help are people who don't ask for help. Right? You have not because you ask not. I don't know how. Google. Okay. YouTube. Um, call a friend. Call somebody who knows. I, that cannot be an excuse in the industrial That could have been an excuse in the industrial age, but not now. Okay. Oh, this one, number eight. It's too hard. Really? Okay. Try living in the biblical 
times, right? I mean, it's too hard. What's hard? I mean, my gosh, we don't want to wait for anything. Unwillingness to take on a challenge is the proclamation of the complacent, okay? Number nine, I haven't done that before. I haven't done that before. So what? Like when I had a baby, I haven't done that before, but I did it, right? Okay, that was hard. That was hard, okay? Oh, this one, this one, one of, it's like this is probably, it's number 10, but I'm sure this is not in any order. I don't have time, okay? I don't buy that. Even though we lead busy lives, you know, a lot of times we misappropriate our time, okay? You know, not making time for you to progress is your own fault. You know, you have 24 hours a day. It says we should read at least 20 minutes a day. I don't know. I, I know that I read more than 20 minutes a day because I want to. It's like if it's a chore for you to like read something for 20 minutes, then, you know, you might want to say, you know, I need to do something about this. I cannot make this as an excuse. Because there were times when I was a little girl, I loved to read, but there were times when I was tired to read. But after a couple of days, I crave it. Like, oh, I haven't had my dose of reading. Okay. The rules won't let me. Okay, then maybe you should break them. I don't know, break out of the box. Unless you're breaking the law, maybe sometimes rules are made to be broken. Don't quote me, I'll deny that. <laughs> okay, well, rules are meant to provide guidance, okay? But sometimes, you know, I believe in the saying, you know, to do things right, but I tell my staff and even my kids all the time, Doing things right is good, but doing the right thing is even better. Okay. Number 12, I'll do it after. Manana, I'll do it after I go to pray or I'll work out. <laughs> I've said that. Um, but I looked like I was going to work out. I had all good intentions, <laughs> but I failed to execute. What was my excuse? Because I went to Elio's instead. Okay? I stuffed my face instead. But I worked harder the following day. <laughs> believe it or not. Okay. So do you hear yourself saying these things? Have you heard yourself saying any of those 12 things that I read? Well, if we can turn, I have like two minutes, Romans 120. I'm just going to read a couple of scriptures or some scriptures concerning excuses. In Romans 1.20, I'm paraphrasing, all unbelievers are without excuse before God. All unbelievers, okay, they will not have any excuse without, they will not have any excuse before God. And then in Luke 13.24 through 27, again, I'm just kind of, just read it and, summarizing it in Luke. No excuses will be accepted in the day of judgment. If you heard it and you didn't act on it and God, Jesus, decided to come because we don't know the time of day, right? You will not, that will not be excusable anymore. You will not have any excuse on that great day of judgment because you heard it, you rejected it. Now, Jude 1, 15 through 16. This is a small book, but it's pretty powerful. Read it. It's one, like, chapter. Okay. God will convict or convince all ungodly excuse makers in that great day. And in Luke 12, 15, it says, Beware. Take care. Protect yourself against the least bit of greed. Life is not defined by what you have, even when you have a lot. You cannot be excused 
for not giving if you had something to give. Why didn't you give? What was your excuse? You're stingy, you're greedy, you're hoarding, right? When there's a lot of people that are in need. So in closing, I'm asking you, where do you spend most of your time? In mediocrity or excellence? I hope that we'll all decide to go on that side of excellence. Amen. Thank you.